several days of uh, of this you know talk on um, lifestyle medicine and um, if there is anything that is key here is that we are first of all learning this for ourselves to put it into practice and then um, be able to now uh, give a testimony to our patients and be able to to um, have them also follow. Um, so, of course, we started with an overview of what lifestyle medicine was. We looked also at issues to do with exercise and how to even prescribe it, and um, happiness and how it relates to our well being, and then our meals, how to prepare, when to take, and things like that. Um, today, we will round up with obesity, uh, proven strategies for. For daily practice again um uh, this whole cme is also being facilitated by the just lifestyle medicine and uh, at just lifestyle and digital medicine group right um so today again to anchor that is uh no other person but uh dr daniel meshak and then he will do the honors of introducing our speaker for this evening and um, then we'll go on. And as we always have done, we will take questions and comments at the end of the presentation. Uh, we will record and um, share the links uh, of all the recordings on YouTube so you can, at your convenience, subsequently even follow all the lectures. Um, so because of that, we'll plead that as much as possible, uh, mute your mics so that uh, we can have clear their recordings. Um, then um, I will also still put the link for us to get your emails and other contacts so that we can email your CME certificates to you. Okay, so uh, yeah, so again, if, if you've done that before, uh, you don't need to still uh, send your email again. I think we'll just use uh, what has been sent. But if, if, you, if this is your first time, or if you've not uh, put up your email address, then I'll, I'll, I'll put up the link in the chat, chat box. Then you will just click to the Google form and just let us have your, your details. Again, thank God for technology. This meeting for all the days has been such that we've had people from different parts of the country, not just uh, a plateau state affair. And uh, again, that's the wonders of technology. So without much wasting time, let me just hand over to Dr. Daniel Meshak, and then he will carry on from there. All right, Dr. Meshak, over to you. Sorry, Meshak, I don't know if it's my device. We can't, we can't hear you very well. It's not loud enough. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, loud and clear now. Okay. I said, um, I want to appreciate the leadership of the uh, CMDA, uh, Plateau State, uh, for this opportunity that is from the uh, Digital and Lifestyle Medicine Group. I want to uh, start by, you know, apologizing on behalf of uh, our head, that's Professor Madaiki. He is busy somewhere, but he will join us in the course of the uh, presentation. And then also, um, the presentation was supposed to come up yesterday, but however, because of challenges we had with uh, technology, we couldn't bring him. So we really appreciate your patience. So without waste of time, we'll just go ahead uh, into today's presentation. And today's presentation is uh, titled Obesity, Proving Strategies for Daily Practice. And it's going to be presented by none other than uh, a consultant, a uh, family physician, and also a member of the Jude uh, Digital Health and Lifestyle Medicine uh, Group, none other than um, Dr. Isha Nandi Tokit. So over to you, Dr. Isha. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Meshak, and thank you so much, CMDA. I also want to appreciate our mentor, Professor Madaki. Can you hear me? 
Okay, I also want to appreciate our mentor, Professor Madaki, for this opportunity. And I'm still going to apologize for what happened yesterday that we were not able to present. Okay, so without wasting time, we'll continue with our presentation. And um, we'll be talking about obesity. I'll be looking at the proven strategies for daily practice. So we'll go through this outline, learning objectives, we'll talk about the introduction, briefly define obesity and look at the burden of obesity. We also want to classify obesity and then talk about the measurements and then perception and willingness to change, lifestyle approaches to treatments, medical and surgical treatments, obesity stigma. And then I have a little testimony to share and then we'll conclude. Uh, learning objectives, at the end of this uh, presentation, I would like us to at least appreciate the burden of obesity and then to know the practical lifestyle strategies for treatment. And then we should be able to take home uh, screening strategies, how we'll be able to screen our patients in our daily practice and agree to design uh, their weight management plan. Um, as a way of introduction, uh, obesity is very, very common. This is just a picture of someone who is very, very obese. This is actually exaggerated, but uh, pictures like this are common everywhere. And then when we look at the evolution of man, we can see that um, this is how the trend has been. And we are hoping that we will not end up this way completely because Almost everybody, uh, people are getting obese these days. And historically, the early man was a hunter-gatherer. So as a hunter-gatherer, you know, he wouldn't stay in one place. He was active, going from one place to another, trying to hunt. And then the food, the food quantity was meager or small. So obesity is believed to have started when man began agriculture and domesticating animals. So um, when he started domesticating animals and farming, you know, food became surplus. Man was able to gather food, eat excessively, and then obesity began to be, was, was noticed. But man began to have excess food. And then biblically, we can relate when the Israelites were on their journey um, from Israel to the, from Egypt to the promised land, you know, when they complained about hunger, lack of food, and then God provided manna. And the manna was not provided as in surplus. God uh, cautioned them. He commanded them to just speak exactly what they would need for themselves. That's to tell us that excessive eating is not actually good. And they, are, and they were just to gather what would be enough for them and their families only. Those are gathered excess. You know, it got uh, spoiled. And initially, uh, even up to, up to some uh, these days, obesity was initially noticed as uh, was seen as, a, an, as an evidence of wealth, and it was common among the elites. In many African countries, it's still viewed as a sign of good living, and many low and middle income countries are now facing a double burden of malnutrition, the uh, over malnutrition and under malnutrition. So while these countries continue to deal with the problems of infectious diseases and undernutrition. On, on they are also experiencing a rapid upsurge in non-communicable diseases. And this with, uh, with risk factors such as obesity and overweight, especially in urban settings. Uh, obesity is defined as a chronic medical condition characterized by excessive accumulation of fats leading to increased health risk. We know it's not every fat that leads to increased health risk, but in obesity, the fat, the increased fat leads to uh, health risk. And obesity occurs when excessive fat accumulates regionally. It could be globally or some regions or both. And it's usually generally defined as a body mass index of greater or equal to 30 kilo, uh, kilograms per meter square. A person is traditionally considered to be obese if they are more than 20% of their ideal weight. And that ideal weight must take into account the person's height, the person's age, the person's sex, and then the build. But in children, BMI of greater than 25th percentile, 95th percentile, sorry, in the reference population is 
termed uh, obese. The reference population in the sense that males and females are categorized differently and also sometimes based on the race. So we have been seeing an uh, obesity um, epidemic these days. It's been said that about 3.4 million deaths are caused by overweight and obesity. And in adults, it's about 27%, 27.5%, and in children, about 47.1%, uh, especially in uh, developed countries. And um, yeah, about 37% of the world's adult population is said to be overweight or obese. And 40% of overweight or obese children and adolescents are found worldwide. And then there is no country that has succeeded in decreasing obesity in the last 33 years. There's none. And the percentage of the world's uh, obese living in the developed countries is about 62%. Currently, the, as we said, the world is facing an obesity um, epidemic. In the US, the age, between the age range of 20 to 74 years, it's about 19.7% 19, 19 in males and 24% in, in females. It's generally higher almost everywhere in females than in males. And uh, worldwide, obesity is nearly, uh, has nearly tripled between 1975 and 2016. In 2016, more than 1.9 billion adults, 18 years and older, were overweight. Or, and of this overweight group, about 65 million people were said to be obese. 39 percent of adults aged 18 years and above are overweight in 2016, and 13 percent were obese. Overall, about 13% of the world's adult population, 11% in men and 15% in women. Again, we said women are more prone to obesity. Most of the world's population live in countries where overweight and obesity kills more people than overweight. And we should always remember that obesity is preventable. In Africa, the introduction of processed foods combined with uh, economic growth have caused Africa's obesity rates to soar very, very high and quickly. In the past six, six, six years, the prevalence of obesity had jumped from 14, 1,400% 1, in Burkina Faso and 500% in Ghana, Benin, and Ethiopia. And we can see the consequences, are, the consequences are accumulating. In West Africa, between February and March, a meta-analysis was performed using the that Simon Leon Light uh, uh, random effect model. The objective of the study was to determine the distribution of the trends in obesity in adults, in adult West African population. And 13 studies were conducted in urban settings, 13 in mixed urban and rural setting, and then uh, in urban and uh, rural setting. The body mass index was used as a yardstick to uh, define obesity. And women were more likely, the pre, sorry, the prevalence of obesity in West Africa was estimated to be about 10% at 95% uh, confidence interval, 90, yes. And women were more likely to be obese than men. And urban residents were more likely to be obese than rural residents. And the time trial analysis indicated that prevalence of obesity in urban West Africa were more than doubled over the 15 years and accounted for almost entirely on women. And urban residents and women have particularly high risk of overweight and obesity. And obesity is rising fast in women. In Nigeria, a systematic review of uh, papers published on the prevalence of obesity among adults in, in the country was carried out covering articles published from January 2001 and September 2012. Uh, in Nigeria, the prevalence was said to be about 20.3% to 35%. And the prevalence of obesity ranged from 8.1, oh, for, sorry, for overweight and obesity, 8.1 to 22%. So the prevalence of overweight and obesity in Nigeria is also of epidemic uh, proportion. And in JAWS, coming home, a study by Puppet and colleagues in 2005 showed that the prevalence of overweight and obesity was about 21%, 90% in males and 23% in females. And the prevalence, um, the highest incidence of overweight and obesity was found in the 
age range of 35 to 45 or 44 years. And the prevalence rate of the overweight and obese in, in obesity in urban adults in just appear moderately high as at then. And then a cross-sectional study by Professor Kurin and Co also showed that there's an increased uh, prevalence of obesity in school children. And it was more in private school children than in public school children. So classification of um, weight or obesity. Um, for the weight for us to calculate the patient's uh, the, or the person's weight status, we have to calculate the body mass index. Usually it's the commonest tool used. And the, a, a person with a BMI of 18.5 is said to be underweight, 18.5 to 24.9 is said to be normal. And 25 to 29.9 is overweight and obesity, as we said, is a BMI of 30 and above. So, uh, but in some Southeastern uh, Asian countries, the BMI uh, classification is really lower. It's lower in most of the Southeastern, uh, Southeast Asian regions. So on the, on the nutrition, on the weight is defined as a BMI of less than 18.5 and normal 18.5 to 22.9 against our own 24.9. And overweight is defined as BMI of 23 to 25. Our own is 25 to 29.9. And obesity for them is um, BMI of greater than 25. So there are measurements that we can use to assess uh, the body fatness, not necessarily just the body mass index. So we use one, first of all, is the body mass index. We use the waist circumference. We can use the waist hip ratio, the skin fold thickness using calipers. We can use the body mass, uh, body fat analyzer and body fat to muzzle ratio and others. We can also use the height to waist instead of the, uh, the height to waist circumference, where, okay, well, I'll explain later. For the BMI, we know that the BMI is calculated in kilograms per square meter, and it has its limitations. It does not differentiate the body types. You know, for someone who is pear-shaped or apple-shaped, or someone that has just body, uh, muscle mass, not necessarily fast, fat mass or bone mass, BMI cannot differentiate it. And it cannot state the areas of fat deposition, and also it cannot differentiate bone mass, fat mass, and the rest. So yes, it's still, yet it's still widely used because the researchers have shown that it corroborates other measurements. The difference between it and most of the other fat measurements, the difference is not much. And BMI is very, very easy to calculate, and then it also makes uh, work easier, rather than going for other calculations where the Kali use caliper or other things that are maybe not readily available. So, uh, based on the uh, classification, I want us to look at this classification also based on the risk estimate. Those that are underweight, we know that um, they usually have increased risk too. So, but those that are actually of normal weight or uh, they have very low risk. And they're obese, obesity, they have a very high risk. And in this case, we want to classify obesity based on uh, the classes. There are other in class one to three. So the class one is B, uh, BMI of 30 to 34.9. And then the risk is, is high. And uh, obesity class two is from BMI of 34 to 39.9, which has a very high risk. And then BMI of 40 and above is extremely high, or it's also called a morbid obesity, and it has a very high, extremely high risk of diseases. So the waist circumference, the waist circumference uh, is a measurement done using a simple measuring tape, and uh, it's really done around the umbilicus, or you can also use just the lowest at the lowest at the bottom of the lowest rib. And in men, the measurement should not be greater than 102 centimeters, straight down in centimeters, and in women should not be greater than 88 centimeters. The waist tip ratio can also be done with a simple measuring tip, just the ratio between the waist uh, circumference and the hip circumference. So um, in men, the ratio should not be more than 0 0.9 uh, 
uh, 0 0.9 and in female should not be greater than 0 0.85. And other measurements as I've explained earlier, we can use the skin full thickness using the caliper, dual energy, uh, X-ray absor absorptionometry, hydrostatic weighing, air displacement, platysmography, um, bioelectric impedance analysis, and then bioimpedance spectroscopy, which are hardly uh, done here. So um, the types of obesity, I thought I told that about the two body shapes, the two body types. You know, some people can uh, maybe pear shaped, those that have the shape, as in, they call it, can be called figure eight, and then the apple shape. And both of them may be overweight, but usually the health risk is usually more on the, on people with the apple shape. And the apple shape is really commoner in males, those are gather abdominal fats. And then the pear shape is really seen more in women. So what are the causes of obesity? For us to understand the causes, uh, we we'll have to look at the, the balance between calorie intake and calorie output, out, uh, output. So, and there are different causes, could be genetic, could be environmental, and it could be our behavior. So it's a triangle and all this could pose risk. So genetic causes, usually they are non-modifiable causes, but our behavior will be able to help us to prevent the risk associated uh, with obesity. And then the environment too can pose uh, a risk to one being obese based on uh, the type of diet, things we do around uh, in our environment too. But usually behavior too is a combination of the three genetics, environment, and then the behavior. So it's an interaction between the genetics and environment. So um, there are some could be ethnic causes. Some people are prone to obesity because of um, their type, they're from the, the, the ethnic group. They are usually on the fat side, uh, maybe having large fat accumulation and uh, could be familiar causes. And the high concordance has been seen in twins, thereby making it uh, very, very likely that genetics play a very, very important role in uh, diabetes and um, obesity. And then the environment too, as I've I said earlier, eating, uh, eating has less activity, birth weight, um, other causes, diseases, inflammation can all um, cause obesity. And there are risk factors that are associated with um, obesity, could be cardiovascular diseases. They're very, very common. Obese patients are prone to cardiovascular diseases type two diabetes, osteoarthritis, cancers, cognitive mood disorders, and sleep apnea, especially um, in sleep apnea, especially in people that are very, very fat, and then the neck, they have fat, um, more fat around the neck. And then in osteoarthritis, usually seen in patients that are very fat, their weights usually um, pose more weight, they, they put more weight on the bones, thereby causing um, arthritis. Then um, let's look at the perception and willingness to change. Perception and willingness to change. Let's see how people perceive their weight and how they're willing to change based on how they perceive their weight. A descriptive um, qualitative study was conducted among black men in South Africa. The participants uh, were of the age range of 35 to 70 years of age. And the participants were generally believed to, uh, that they generally believed that obesity could lead to health conditions such as heart attack, stroke, diabetes, and hypertension. However, the severity of obesity was perceived differently in the groups. They grouped them into those that had normal weight, those that had those that were overweight, and then those that were uh, obese. So, in in the men in all the groups, the normal weight, overweight, and the obese group, they believed that. Um, they perceived uh, obesity to be serious and threat uh, and a threat to their health, whereas overweight women did not believe so. And obese, the obese participants had, ex uh, had experienced chronic disease conditions. Those that had experienced chronic disease conditions uh, indicated perception of risk of obesity and cardiovascular diseases. 
but an obese patient, the obese participants, particularly men, they expressed willingness to lose uh, weight compared to the men and the women who were overweight. So they believe that overweight is normal and not a disease or subjective norms and inaccessibility to physical activity, activity facilities, negative influence, negatively influenced the participants' readiness to lose weight. Those were their findings. And then they concluded that low perception of, of threats of obesity to health, particularly among overweight women in the community indicated a considerable challenge to obesity control. So it's believed that if you don't see yourself as obese or you, and you don't perceive the, child, the health, health, the health risk associated with obesity, you are most likely not to engage in any activity that will help you to lose weight. And then there is a model that uh, helps to understand the perception of patients to uh, weight loss and obesity. The patient's previous behavior is sorry. The model is called the prototype willingness model or the PWM model. The Person's previous uh, behavior can affect the person's attitude and the person's subjective norm and also the prototype. The prototype in this case is someone that the person looks up to. A prototype is a significant other that the person looks, that the, the, the individual looks up to. So, and the prototype can affect the person. Behavior the behavior of the patient and willingness to change. So if the prototype is someone that I look up to, assuming I'm the, I'm the patient, and I look up to someone who is fat, I think and the person that I'm looking up to or my role model is not willing to lose weight, I may not be willing to lose weight too. And then if the norms, the subjective norms, especially in African, let's say in, in our African setting, we believe that, um, uh, it, it used to be a belief, I believe it's changing now, that uh, obesity is a sign of wealth. So if I'm fat or I'm, a, I'm obese, I may not be able to look at it as something bad. I, I, I won't have any threat. I won't feel any threat to the risk of associated with, with obesity. So I'm most likely not willing, may not be willing to change my behavior. And my behavior may be to add weight instead of losing weight. And then the attitude that uh, I perceive, if I, if I, if I feel that, Obesity is, uh, if I feel vulnerable, I, I may be at risk of some diseases and I mean, I mean, I'm likely to change my behavior. So the um, behavior intention or expectation can, can be affected by my subjective norm and also my behavior towards and un unwillingness to change can also be affected by my subjective norm. Same likewise with my attitude and also the prototype. And then both my behavior and willingness to change and also my behavior and expectation will affect my health behavior. Um, I've just, this is just to explain, to explain the, the, the prototype willingness model, uh, which states that the behavior influences attitudes, perceived, uh, perceived vulnerability and norms that affect the behavior intentions and then the health behavior in general. And this model also holds that the prototype influences behavior previous behavior and in turn affect the willingness for health behavior. And as I've explained earlier, the prototype in this model refers to the risk image, that's the personality or the significant person whose behavior can be adopted by some people as ideal. So it's like a role model to those people. So um, there's the body image rating is another way of um, assessing how a, a patient perceives uh, the uh, weight or his weight. So uh, there are different body shapes for both, for both males and females. So it's used, um, you, you can ask a patient to touch or to select which body type the patient believes or perceives has. You can see a very fat woman. I mean, you pick this, uh, maybe number five, patient is number 14, but maybe decide to pick number five as, as what she perceives. Uh, is her body type. So if the patient perceives as well, very slim, the likelihood that the patient is going to lose weight is very, very small. But if the patient perceives herself as very fat, and then she's working towards losing
contemplation, the action stage, okay, the action stage, the maintenance and relapse. Okay. I, I think you so the first to, stage is characterized by again, stage is characterized by no. denial and ignorance of the problem. If the patient has not even perceived obesity as a problem, or he denies or he feels I'm not obese, like I showed in the, 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 the body image rating, a very uh, obese patient is touching a very slim body as her own body type. So at that stage, the patient has not even started any contemplation, it's at the pre-contemplation stage. Is not even willing to make any adjustments at all. And then, um, okay, is not able to make any adjustments. We've lost you. Just continue. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear Patient is not willing to make adjustments. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he's not willing to make any adjustments at all. So at this stage, what you tell the patient is to have a rethink, as we teach the patient, if you're meeting the patient at the pre-contemplation stage, you are teaching the patient to have a rethink and then analyze the person's uh, action and then to assess the patient's uh, risk. And at the contemplation stage, it's characterized by ambivalence and conflicted emotions. The patient already understands, yes, I have this problem. Obesity is a problem, but is not has not even made any decision to start something is confused or is trying to do something yes it's not trying to it's trying to um make it work out but has not been able to make an attempt at all so the strategy to um to at this stage is to weigh the pros and cons of the patient of your behavior what uh, what are the the, the the benefits if i lose weight what will i lose if i lose weight and then you confirm the patient's uh, readiness on, 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 on ability to change and then you identify barriers to change is there something is there something that the patient uh, feels is hindering the patient from trying to achieve or are trying to start weight loss could it be the patient does not know how to start the education could it be that there's no um There's nothing provided for the patient to start. So at this stage, that's when that's when we teach the patient. Then um, at the preparation stage, that's the third stage, the patient is exp is experimenting with small, small changes. The patient has already understood I have I'm, I'm obese, I'm willing to change. So how do I do it? The patient maybe starts uh, maybe dieting or uh, exercise, but maybe small, small. Start, we'll start small and stop, start small and stop. And then the patient is also collecting information, maybe reading about uh, the possibility of losing weight and how to do it. So at, when you're meeting a patient at this stage, you write, you write down the patient, you make the patient to write down his goals. What are his goals? What, what, what does the patient want to achieve? And then you prepare a plan of action for the patient and you make a list of motivating statements for the patient. And then at the fourth stage, the action stage. So what um, at this stage is characterized by direct uh, actions towards a goal. The patient has already believed he has obesity. He has made up his mind. I want to lose weight, and is making up uh, actions that will be able to help lose weight. So at this stage, you help the patient to reward his successes. The patient is working. Is working, and if let's say using a pedometer and um, is achieving his target uh, step count, you reward the patient's successes. You give yourself a treat, and then you seek out social support too at this stage. And then stage five, which is uh, the maintenance stage. At this stage, this is the best stage. The patient has already taken action and is trying to maintain, is consistent with whatever is doing, whatever strategy is taking to lose weight. And then you avoid the temptation of um, losing weight and I, I avoid the temptation of, I'll, I'll call it relapse or I'll say not continuing or not being consistent. So the strategy is to develop a coping strategy for temptation. If like um, maybe the patient decides to do it, uh, go for dieting, you know, 
how the patient is okay. There are some places you're not supposed to be at because if you go for a party or you go for any program and there's a temptation of you seeing one of your favorite food and you want to indulge. So at the, at the, at the stage, you tell the patient, I'm going to Suzu, please, or when you're going for your particular food, when they're serving food, you eat your food. And then you have to do it yourself. And then the sixth stage is the stage everybody dreads, is, is the relapse stage. And at this stage, it's characterized by disappointment and frustration and feelings of fear. And the patient may feel, I may feel, your doctor, I've done this. There's nothing I've not done to lose weight. I have walked, I have jogged, I have done dieting, I've done everything, but I am not losing weight. And the patient is going back because it's not been able, it's not been able to sustain uh, the activity that uh, he has planned. But at this stage, you identify the triggers. What could have led to the patient not losing weight? Is it that the patient is not doing it very well? Or is the patient not is doing the wrong thing? You can recognize the barriers to success. And then you reaffirm the patient's goal and commitment to change. And then help the patient to start all over again or yourself, whatever. You, uh, whoever the patient is, you just help the patient or yourself to start all over again. So um, basically, these are the stages of change. So the treatment, treatment of obesity, we look at the treatment and then the proven, the proven strategies. So in treating obesity, actually it's a very, 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 very slow process. And it requires a lot of patience, both on the side of the patient and the doctor. So both, of the, both the patient and the doctor need to be very, very patient. And it's usually a combination therapy. You can't just start one thing and expect it to work. And it's a multidisciplinary approach. And most often, uh, usually it's a lifestyle modification. So let's look at the uh, proven strategies and then we'll look at a few of them and then round up. The proven strategies for daily practice are, one, the first of all, as we said, is a combination of lifestyle modification, medication and surgery. It's been shown that combination of the lifestyle modification, medication and surgery leads to about 45 or 60% uh, low weight loss. And then another strategy is physical activity. And then we look at the physical activity uh, environment modification. If the physical activity uh, environment is modified to suit uh, the candidate, the patient will likely be able to do uh, the physical activity very well. Like in Nigeria, we don't have roadworks. We do the, the, even our normal roads don't even have shoulders, pavements that patient can walk around. So it actually deters some people from Walking up, uh, work, uh, walking or exercising outdoors, and then uh, behavior and lifestyle modification. For people, it is it's 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 been shown that for people that are able to change their behavior, assuming um, excessive eating, the patient is eating excessively or consuming alcohol excessively, the patient is able to modify his behavior and improve in his lifestyle modification. The patient tends to do very well. And then self-monitoring and feedback. Whatever you're doing, if you don't monitor yourself and have a feedback, it's difficult for you to be able to uh, move ahead because you may not be able to know what you're achieving. And then the eating environment is another factor of, uh, for modification. The eating environment, which we'll look at it briefly now, and then the nutritional education. Some people may not, they may have all the money, but they don't know how or what to eat. So if you don't uh, know, if you don't have the knowledge of the type of food to eat, it's also posed uh, as a barrier. But, but for people that have the knowledge of what to eat and how to eat, it usually tend to do very well. And then support systems, very, very important. We may think obesity is a very simple thing, but obesity on, low, uh, uh, on its own can cause uh, depression. We see patients are depressed because they're just obese. And then apart from that, people stigmatize them. So if they don't have good support system, they may not be able to uh, lose weight or to strategize to lose weight. So counseling, psychotherapy, patient support groups are very, very important. And commercial group like uh, family support, especially in program dropouts are very, very important. There's some people that may start a program, even commercial programs, but may drop out maybe because of one reason or the other. So at that stage, support is very, very key. And then um, 
weight loss programs are very, very important, especially commercial programs. It's been uh, believed that if you are able to pay for a program, you are likely going to do better than those that are just going for free programs. So um, commercial programs are very, very effective. Then we'll look at this key treatment uh, modalities. We've talked about increased physical activity, dietary modification. Uh, Dr. Meshak talked about physical activity some days back. And uh, Professor, Professor Madaki talked about diet. So we'll just look at them briefly and then talk about modification, medication, sorry, and surgery, hormonal therapy, and browning of white fat cells. So in physical activity, I'll just run through a few since we already know. Uh, there's a tendency that if you increase physical activity, you tend to burn more calories. So physical activity is very important. Increase walking at least about 10, 100 steps a minute. Swimming is very important too. And for you to increase your step counts or to increase your physical activity, you can take stairs instead of elevators. You can get off the bus to wherever you're going to earlier, like a stop earlier, and then walk to that particular place. And then you can park your car at least 500 meters or more away from where you're supposed to be going to, and then you walk. I think I used to do that a lot when I was in June. Then um, you can have, yeah, you can do your house chores, gardening. You can also use uh, devices like pedometer and set a target and ensure you meet up. Then you remember the fifth principle of exercise, the frequency, the intensity, the type, and then the time of its of the size. Then uh, when you're using a pedometer, if you're having less than 5,000 steps, it's said to be sedentary, you're sedentary. So you have a sedentary lifestyle. But if your footsteps are up to 5,000 to 7,499, then you're low active. But if it's 7,500 to 9,999, then you're somewhat active. At 10,000 steps to 12,499 steps, you are said to be active. But if you have step counts of 12,500 and above, then you're highly active. So, but anyhow, keep moving. Then the dietary modifications, we have to look at the portion control, high fiber diets, nuts. I don't want to repeat them because it's been taught already. Then we have you have to increase your water intake. Eat slowly. Take at least five servings of fruits. Take all heavy meals, preferably before three p.m. because it will be difficult for you to digest when you are asleep. And then you take low salt and avoid refined sugar in all forms. And then you try and prepare meals at home, and you can carry to work. And you learn to estimate or measure portions or sizes in restaurants. Some people feel, ah, I'm, I'm paying for this food. So if I'm uh, not going to finish this food, it's like I've wasted my money. So they may want to eat everything. No, that's very wrong. So we have to like estimate. You can even ask for a little portion in a restaurant. Then you learn to recognize uh, nice fat content. Of most of the, all, all the menus that you're going to get. And they eliminate smoking, reduce alcohol consumption, and then you substitute low caloric for high caloric foods. And then you modify the route to work. If you have a very favorite uh, food shop or a restaurant that you really like, and then their food is not really uh, lifestyle oriented, then you have to be careful. You can even take another route instead of taking that route to the work, the workplace. So the medical treatments, and in medical treatment, it's usually not done alone. It must be in, combi in combination with um, lifestyle modification. And it's not for every obese patient. 
and is indicated in patients with BMI of 30 or more, or BMI of 27 or more, and uh, with those that have um, health problems like comorbidities, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, all those, they are indicated, they can have uh, medical treatment. So when lifestyle modification are not achieving much, and then the patient is not willing to continue, you can add and then keep counseling the patient to be able to increase um, the lifestyle modification. And then you consider the likely benefits of weight loss. If I'm going to use this med med medication, will it have any effect on the patient? Will the patient be able to lose weight? And can I make the patient to increase weight loss even after use of this medication? And then you can now start. So you also consider the possible uh, side effects of the drugs and then the comorbidities and the other medication that the patient is taking. And then you have to get a family history and medical history of the patient. And also consider the drug. I can't just pick a patient and say, oh, because you're not doing well with lifestyle medication, you have agreed and then I want to start you on this drug and then I'll just go, not knowing if the patient can afford it or not. So the medications, um, the commonest ones around are uh, Holistat, and it's really used in adults and can be used for can be used in, in children greater than 12 years of age and it acts by preventing fat absorption and the commonest side effects are diarrhea gas oily stools abdominal pain it's really serious abdominal cramps so the patient needs to know and then locasterine has was withdrawn in 2000 sorry, this year, in February, this year. And it acts on the serotonin receptors and it reduces appetite. So it was linked to increased occurrences of cancers. That was why it was withdrawn from the market. The side effects are constipation, cough, dizziness, dry mouth, and the rest. And fent fentanyl, Fentanyl to pyramid is a combination. Uh, it, fentanyl on its own reduces appetite and then to pyramid increases society. The side effects are commonly constipation, dizziness, dry mouth, and then natrazone and uh, bupropion. They are also a combination uh, drug. So um, natrazone, which is used to treat alcohol, and drug dependence and bupropion was is used to treat uh, depression and also in patients uh, trying to quit smoking. So both of them reduce uh, hunger and then the side effects are constipation, diarrhea, dizziness, dry mouth, headaches, increased blood pressure. So we're looking at, we're going to look at the surgery and in surgery, again, I have to emphasize, it has to be in combination with lifestyle modification. And candidates must be willing to make associate lifestyle changes. The lifestyle measures must, must be instituted first. You have to start a lifestyle modification and maybe you're not achieving, and then the patient, it has, um, the patient has morbid, other morbid conditions. And then you want to walk fast. So that's when you now go for surgery. And then those that have BMI of greater than 40 or those that have BMI of greater than 35 with serious comorbid conditions. So they are of two types. Usually the gastric sleeve or gastric band, which is also known as the restrictive surgery or the gastric bypass. The gastric band, usually the advantages are it can be adjusted and reversed. And then it does not interfere with the normal gastric digestion. And it's done laparoscopically. laparoscopically. And then it's easier to perform and safer than gastric bypass. So looking at it, we can see just uh, the, the stomach is 
there's a band that is attached to the stomach to like reduce the, the size of the stomach, thereby helping the patient to eat small, small amount of uh, food at a time. And usually after surgery, the patient is supposed to take small quantities of food. If the patient eats so much, it may tend to vomit. So um, the restrictive surgeries, the disadvantages are that usually re results in less weight loss compared to the gastric bypass. And patients generally lose weight about half of their excess body weight in the first year after restrictive surgery. And only 20% keep the weight loss after 10 years. So the gastric bypass um, is a malabsorptive surgery. It reduces the amount of calories and nutrients absorbed. And the patient loses weight quickly. The weight loss can be maintained for about 10 years or more. And it's more difficult to perform, but results in long-term nutritional deficiency. It can result in long-term nutritional deficiency, like calcium, iron deficiency. And it has an increased likelihood of hernias. So in restrictive, um, sorry, in gastric bypass, you can bypass a part of the intestine, thereby restricting absorption of food. So looking at the treatment success, if you're just using lifestyle modification alone, you can have a 1% to 5% um, increase or in weight loss. But if, if you're combining lifestyle uh, pharmacotherapy, it's 5% to 15%. And if it's lifestyle with surgery, it's usually about 20 to 40%. But we all this uh, medical and surgical, med, um, treat, most of treatment have their own side effects. They have their own problems. But if one can sustain the lifestyle modification alone, you achieve better. Then the hormonal therapy is a future consideration. A study published in 2014 attributed the success of bariatric surgeries to impact it has on hormones. And harnessing the hormones could lead to a successful non-surgical therapy. The hormones are actually presently not available. Then browning on fat cells. We know that uh, mammals, humans and mammals, they have two types of fat cells, the brown cells and then the white fat cells. And the brown cells are usually a fat type, type of fat cells that, that burn calories and produce heat, while the fat cells store calories. So it's been projected that if we can have the brown cells for the white cells to behave like the brown cells, then there's a likelihood that we will not be able to store more fat, so obesity will be reduced or prevented. So I would like us, like us to look at uh, obesity stigma. Well, it may not be a problem here in this environment, but in developed countries, it's a very big problem. And in some other areas, even in uh, underdeveloped worlds, we still have uh, obesity stigma. Obesity stigma and discrimination towards obese patients are pervasive and pose numerous consequences for their psychological and physical health. And despite decades of science documenting weight stigma, its public health implications are widely ignored. So these obese patients are usually blamed for their weight loss, for their weight, and with common perceptions that uh, when you tell somebody that she's fat or you blame her, it may push the patient to like go and change her behavior. No, but it's not true. So these patients may feel very bad. Some may be depressed instead. So they are by pushing them back to obesity. So if Looking at um, the patient as a whole, we can use this as our own strategy to weight loss. If you are encountering a patient 
if you look at the patient, the patient looks very fat. We first of all, we weigh the patient, get the patient's height, the measurement, um, the weight, the height, and then you calculate the patient's BMI. If the BMI greater than 25, okay, if, if the patient has a BMI of greater, greater than 25, you also do other measurements, the waist circumference, and then if the waist circumference is greater than 89 centimeters in females, 102 in males, then you assess for risk factors for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and other uh, chronic diseases. And if the BMI is greater than 30 or 25, 29, then you have to measure the waist circumference also, and the patient has to see a clinician. If the patient has a BMI of 24, but no risk factors for cardiovascular diseases, then you have to reinforce the patient's uh, education, and then you have to teach the patient about obesity so the patient can maintain that weight, not to tilt the patient into obesity. And then if the patient has a BMI of 30 and more, and then there are no risk factors, then you have to also educate the patient to maintain that weight or to lose weight back to maybe at least greater than, uh, less than 25. Um, the BMI of less than 25, yes. So um, the, 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 the reinforcement or the patient's education could be periodic at different times. Anytime you're seeing the patient, you are reinforcing on how the patient should uh, maintain or lose weight. And then maintenance counseling, so it's very important. And then we have to talk to them about dietary therapy, behavior therapy and physical activity. Very, very important. And it's a continuous process. We have to keep doing it. So um, in conclusion, I would like to share my little testimony. My weight loss journey began about five years ago. I was really overweight. I was, really, I was actually obese. And I, was, I was to see Professor Madak in his office for my dissertation. So when I climbed up, he said, ah, Dr. Ishaya, you can't be panting like that, just two stairs and you're panting. And what, what are you telling your patients? And I was actually touched. I was motivated to like start losing weight. I it was very slow. I started gradually, I was dieting, exercising, increasing my step counts. My exercise, uh, basically dance, I dance at home. I use Zumba dance, figure eight, I use body project, and do all these dances at different times, sometimes with my children. And I was not really achieving much, but at the end, I know I've lost like uh, more than 10 kg in the past five years. And I've tilted from I'm obese and I'm overweight now. Yes, I'm still working on it. I will continue. Also, in conclusion, obesity is very common in our society. It is treatable. Lifestyle modification is the hallmark of treatment. And then we need to support obese patients. And we should never, never stigmatize obese patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nandi Shaya, for this um, wonderful presentation on obesity and capping it beautifully with uh, the, the personal journey. I think one, 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 one thing for me, you know, in, in all of this is the fact that um, I think almost all of you who have spoken have kind of shared personally your experiences in this. And that to me is something very, very encouraging. Um, so as we have always done, um, we will want to take questions and comments. If you would want to speak, please just indicate by raising your hand and then we will uh, ask you to unmute, then you can, you can contribute. Uh, otherwise, you can type in the chat box 
Um, then we will, we will read it. Um, I want to say, since this is our last for in this, I mean, this CME, um, if there is still even any area in the previous lectures that you want further clarification, I, I don't know, but I, I, I am guessing I should have the permission of Prof. Madaiki, Dr. Meshak, and Dr. Labu, and all that to allow uh, if others still want further clarification in any previous uh, lectures, we can we can ask too here. Since after now we this will will end it for us. Um, so I don't know. Is there any? Does anybody want to ask a question? I, I am not. I am not seeing any hand yet. Okay. So. Um, okay. So there's a question here. Mm -hmm. What What role does sleep deprivation play in weight gain? Should I answer now? Okay, yeah, I think if, if you can okay. answer this one, then we will, there are two hands up. I want you to answer this one, then we can now uh, take the, the hands that are up. Okay. Um, sleep on its own is very, very important. And uh, it also helps to prevent obesity or weight gain. If you're, you don't sleep very well, um, stress hormones are usually released. And then those stress hormones can trigger uh, weight gain. And then another thing, another thing that can happen when you don't sleep is that you may likely be doing something, either snacking or eating or doing something at, uh, during the night. So it's possible that you may be eating junks at night, also uh, predisposing you to weight gain, basically. Yes, okay. 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 Dr. Meshak wants to add something. Okay. Yes, Meshak, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. And there's also in addition, there, there is also the whole um, ghrelin and the team. Mm -hmm. and I know that ghrelin promotes uh, appetite yes. while um, the team. Sorry, Dr. Meshak, there's, there's a bit of echo and uh, your voice is echo. Okay. All right. What about now? Aha, better, better. It's better. Okay. So um, usually when we don't sleep, actually the level of ghrelin that is supposed to be low during sleep goes up, while that of leptin that is supposed to be high, which uh, inhibits appetite, goes up. And so you find out that when we don't sleep, there's a tendency that uh, we become more hungry and so we want to eat more food yeah so that's just the addition okay so so lack of sleep will uh, lead to more weight all right thank you so um let me allow dr safia yahaya hongoela to ask her question i know there's a comment she made on the chat but uh, you can you can talk now more. Thank you very much, Dr. Meshak and Dr. Toki for your lovely presentation. Um, I really enjoyed this is you know the life this lifestyle approach, you know, we are in this thing together, you know, to the management of obesity. And I found very interesting and touching the part when you talked about your personal journey. You know, I, I don't know, I would have loved if if you know to ask the icing on the case. If you had actually put your before and after pictures to motivate us, I don't know if you could, you know, that would, you know, be a lovely plus. So, so that's, yeah, I don't know, at least maybe in another, if you have to present it anywhere or if you have it available for us, people, it, it really um, helps to motivate. Um, that's just really what I want to say. It's a lovely presentation, so I really don't have any questions. It's just this part that comment on. I really loved it. Thank you know, you. which I had seen at the earlier ones, but I, I just got, I just came across this one and I just logged in. I was surprised mm -hmm. when he said that Dr. Mesha took physical activity yesterday and somebody else took something the other day, you know, I would have loved to, you know, to allow me to sleep. 
Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yes, I sorry, I'm very sorry. I actually wanted to put the pictures, but I felt it was not, not since it wasn't like my own, uh, uh, yeah, it wasn't yeah. about me. So I didn't put them. So I'm really sorry, but uh, Dr. Meshak is here with me. He hasn't seen me because of time, I'm sure. <laughs> Yes. He can testify that I've really lost it. Yes, uh, that's part of what we're saying. You know, it's not but now for you to add your personal journey, okay? At that point, you are personalizing it and it brings it home to us more and we have been, it will even be better. So really it's not yes. about you, but you are now using yourself as a which is very, very commendable. So you might as well have just and then just, you know, before and after picture. Anything about weight loss journey, you know, before and after is... Yes, very important. You understand? Even now, mm. uh, I would love to see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. it's my video now. All right, Maybe okay. So let us appreciate the beautiful... Oh. My neck. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, fine. It's, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, that this is someone... I see my neck. <laughs> All right, so... I, Thank you for that comment, Ma. Yeah, lovely. Great. Yeah, yeah that is evidence. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In lifestyle medicine, if there is no evidence, it is not lifestyle medicine. It's true. 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 <laughs> lifestyle medicine, we know it now. No evidence, no lifestyle medicine. Correct. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Okay, so thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Beautiful, beautiful comments. Uh, thank you. And thank you. So, Dr. John Collins, uh, if you can ask your question or make your comment, sir. All right. Thank you very much, um, Prof and your team. Thank you for the presentation. Um, Okay, uh, the last mute ourselves. Thank you. Yes, you can. Thank you, you can sir. Go on, okay, so um, I have a question on uh, portion size for weight management. I don't know who will answer that. Um, maybe was an advocate of portion size. Uh, portion size has to do with my understanding of that. Maybe it's wrong. Just one's fist. So your size of food should be the size of your fist. Mm -hmm. Anything outside of that, and, um, it's like added extra. So maybe a comment or clarification on that. Thank you. Okay. So mm -hmm. I, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. So over to you guys. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Yesterday, uh, Prof talked about the uh, portion size uh, in his presentation. And uh, subjectively, what we can use is just a fist of our hands. If you turn your hand into a fist, that's um, at least the approximate size of your stomach. And so that's what you are expected to take. Don't take food until you can feel it almost coming out to your mouth. That's not the essence. You know, it's just to feel until you're just satisfied and then you just leave it there. So when you turn your hands into a fist, that's a... Um, what is recommended and so and most times we advise people also to reduce portion size as a way of uh, of uh, watching their watching weight or trying to lose weight so uh, I think that's uh, what I can say I don't know if uh, any member me, of the team has maybe right. Right. That, that's um, Dr. Misha hello so when you say feast uh, because I know that sometimes when we try to do diabetic education or education for diabetics you're looking at. Now, if you say portion size is my fist, that should include the vegetables or would this be the caps? Uh, I, maybe some further clarification, maybe for those, um, if Prof or someone else wants to talk about it. So if I'm doing portion size, this portion size should include my meat because it's one thing, yes, I can have a little, um, just maybe a fist size of a bar, or rice, and then I have other things that fill up that plate. End of the day, the carbs I get from these other things um, kind of nullifies this, the portion size. That's uh, what I'm looking at. So 
We're looking at portion size in terms of all, including the vegetables and the meat or the fish or any other thing that comes from it. Okay, so uh, in terms of that, uh, usually for most of our food, you find out that you have maybe swallow and then the soup. So most times it's a swallow that you are looking at, but um, uh, when you are having um, maybe with uh, maybe rice, uh, I, I think we want you to take as much vegetable as possible. And so we wouldn't uh, be restricting you much, but um, I'm sure that even with vegetable, you can't just eat plenty of it, you know, like that. Uh, so I, I actually don't have the answer now. I don't know which one is the correct answer when you are taking something like uh, rice with vegetable, but however, I think we can look for that. Uh, and also if uh, Professor Maraiki is uh, online, probably he can help us uh, with that. He was, he was on so point. can you quickly say something before? Okay. Can I quickly say something before Prof speaks? I don't know if he's around. Um, and then um, when, when you look at the, the plates, sometimes we advise the patient to like, their normal plates, the, the normal quantity that fills them up should be divided into three. One, one third of the portion should be only the normal food or the, whatever will fill them up or the, the food they are going to consume. Then the remaining two thirds should be vegetables and fruits. So that they can have a feeling, a, a, a feeling sensation that they are full. So it sounds to reduce the portion or the quantity that the patient is um, consuming of the cups and other things. The meat, the food should be the one third, and then the two thirds should be vegetables and fruits. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let me also bring in something a um, few, maybe some weeks ago. I was looking at. Um, a document of food um, on food and nutrition for Nigeria, and we had this play, uh, portion where the calories that were estimated for Ni local Nigerian food. And I know I posted it, and some shouted, "You know, somebody wants to eat rice, and another person wants to eat jollof rice. The calories in jollof rice are more than calories that you find in other food." And then we are lovers of jollof rice. So invariably I attempt to, um, at weight loss and loving jollof rice seems to be contradictory. I don't know if you've come across that. I guess maybe the oil and all of the other things are maybe added. Okay. Um. Sorry, I don't know if, is in the context of the glycemic index of the foods or? No, it's not, uh, not about the context, but uh, jollof rice, I mean, if you if you have rice, white rice with stew, you are not likely going to eat much oil than if you are going to eat jollof rice because oh, that you. every grain of rice has oil on it. And that increases the calorie Calories, on that. Yeah. So, and then loving jollof rice invariably, yeah. it increases. will be contrary to attempt to attend for weight loss. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Very beautiful comments. Uh, do, do we have any, any more, any more question? Um, uh, okay. Well, I, I know you mentioned um, this obesity stigma and um, something that you said isn't too common around here, but uh, I know as children, uh, you, you find out that when you are playing football, it's usually the fat one, the fat kid that is made the goalkeeper. Uh, you know, maybe some kind of discrimination too. And of course, all sorts of uh, terminology, fatty bomb bomb and all that are things we, we use to describe uh, children who are fat. Um, you know, and um, in medical school, I, we became famous in a very mischievous way. You know, we used to cartoon our mates. And so one of those cartoons we did, we didn't know, you know, the lady in question actually was working on her weight. And, and it was a cartoon uh, strip of someone sitting on uh, Okada and then the tire bursting because uh, she, was, she was fat. And, you know, the, the man asking that she would pay for, for the bus tire. You know, that really 
cause serious katakata that time because they threatened to report us to the dean. <laughs> you know, so, but I mean, it's, it's something that is around us and, um, you know, something that we should, we should take serious. And I'm, I'm very happy that you even gave a personal um, experience of how hard, this is five years, you, you said, you know, to move from obesity to being overweight, you know, and all that. And I mean, I can relate to that. I, I just want to ask if there is anyone who can help. I notice, so like the pedometer I have, if I'm in a car, the thing reads. So I'm just wondering what, what practical advice can you give me? How, how, how can I use it? Because sometimes, okay, so I think the day I really knew this thing was not doing well, we traveled to Abuja and then I realized the thing was saying I had done like 30,000 steps or something. Yes, it yes. was, uh, you know, not correct. So yes. is there any way, what would be, how would you advise someone who has a pedometer that maybe when he's driving, you know, the thing reads because he's in a bumpy road? Yes. Actually, um, I did a work on, a, on pedometer um, personally and I experienced it. But I discovered that there are different types, that uh, there are some that are not very sensitive to movement. Then the, the cheaper ones are actually very sensitive to any small movement at all. They will be counting the steps. Even if you just shake it with your hand, they will count the steps. So it's advisable that you get the one that is less sensitive to movement, that it only counts your steps. You know, and then before you set the pedometer, you're supposed to set the, the step, the, your distance, the step span. You know, you move, you take a, a, one step ahead and then you measure the step span and then you record it in the pedometer so that any other uh, sensation will not be counted as step in your pedometer. That's one way, one way I try to avoid that. Um, uh, over sensitivity or over counting. And then if you're in a car, any bump, it, it keeps um, counting. It's just because of uh, you've not taken that precaution. But if you can get a better one or you use uh, your step your step span to be able to record it in your pedometer while setting it. Most of us, when we buy the pedometer, we just start using it. When we buy the pedometer, we, we just start using it without taking all the necessary precautions to add all our weights, our, the, the calorie intake, blah, blah, blah. All, all those things need to be added into the pedometer to incorporate it so that the pedometer can be very sensitive to pick only your step counts. So if even if you're just jumping in one place, the pedometer will not count if you take your step uh, span. But if you don't uh, put the step span, you'll not be able to ascertain how many steps you've taken in a day. But uh, meanwhile, before you get a better one or before you make that adjustment, you can uh, also adjust, discard. Even if you see thousands of steps, you discard and you take conscious efforts to like know that you're working and then you just record the ones you've, you, are, you know you actually worked for. I don't know if you get to me. You only record the ones, maybe you, you, when you are, you are working, you can switch off the pedometer. If you're sorry, if you're in a car, you can switch off the pedometer okay. and then allow it to read only when you are active. Or you can leave it active, but you will not uh, consider those steps that have been recorded okay. in your pedometer. Thank you, sir. This, 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 is very, this is very helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, maybe one, one, one last for, for me. Um, I know this, this may have to do with yesterday's uh, presentation, but uh, so occasionally you hear about uh, intermittent fasting as a way to lose weight. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Uh, we, I think you are, you are muted. Intermittent fasting. Uh, as uh, Prof explained yesterday, it's uh, you, you try to take your the amount a particular amount of food without, within four hours. So some people can overconsume, some people may take small and all that, but you take it within four hours, and then the remaining uh, twenty hours, or some people take between four to eight hours, some four to six hours. Then the remaining twenty or fourteen to twenty hours, you are you are fasting. Yes. Six, uh, yes, four to eight hours and the remaining 16 hours or eight hours, you're consuming something. Then the remaining 16 hours, you're not eating anything. But in, in, in that case, it helps you. And most times in the daytime, 
that you do uh, intermittent fasting. So some people say between 2 p.m. and maybe 8 p.m. or between 12 p.m. and 6 p.m. you eat something. Then before, uh, then from 6 p.m. till the following morning to 12 p.m. 12 noon, you are hungry. So in that case, you walk around, you burn the calories. You know, you 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 you, you tend to eat just little because when you when you're already very hungry, you may not be able to eat so much. So you eat little and then you burn the calories and then you have little calories stored and then your body begins to burn the fats that has been stored in your body and then weight loss begins. So, but it's, it's very difficult. I tried it. I know I didn't succeed at some points. So I had to go back to my normal meals but small portions and uh, like that. But, yes, sir. Okay. Okay, sorry. Let me just add that... Uh, Basically, what is needed also is that you you try to to adjust according to your own peculiarity as an individual. You individualize what you want, uh, but for most people, it's usually the sixteen eight uh, uh, model. Uh, that is, you fast for sixteen hours and then you eat food for eight hours. And and, and I, I was looking at a, a plan. You know, like when you wake up probably in the morning, maybe you, 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 you don't eat anything. Or if you must eat something in the morning, you just take maybe like Lipton without sugar or water. And then by 12 o'clock, uh, you now eat around 12 or 11, you eat. And then in the next eight, uh, eight hours, you can eat. You can eat food within that period. And then afterwards, by 8 p.m. or so, you stop eating till... Uh, the next day. So in that way, you know, you divide it into eight hours of eating and then 16 hours of fasting, you know, and it has been shown that um, that is good. It helps you. With, it helps even your mental ability. It improves your uh, blood glucose control and the rest. Okay. Is it? Are you listening to me? Okay. okay. So uh, that's just the addition I have. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think this is, this is very, very helpful. Um, okay, so I can't see any hand. I don't know if anyone has any general comments. Uh, so we will be trying to round up. I, I will just, we will just send a poll now. Give us your general impression of the whole experience right from the first day we started. And um, and up till this time, uh, so that uh, at least let's just know how. Again, very, very, very few questions for, for, for us to, to ask and answer. Yes. Um, uh -huh. Then, um, so again, I just want to thank everyone for your patience. Uh, we appreciate you for again joining over and over. We started this on Friday evening. Uh, up till now, we are grateful that you stayed through to the end. I'm sure that the benefits again will be worth it. Um, I don't know whether this will be like busting people's tire, but we are doing it just before a festivity, and this may be one period in time where you will say, "Let's throw away all the rules of watching portions and whatever. Let's enjoy and binge." But uh, so let's see how God will help us in the festivities so that we can look away from the meat, look away from the rice and all the, all the goodies that would come during the Yuletide season. Um, so for those who, again, couldn't participate in the first two days or three days, uh, all the recordings, we will upload them on the CMDA Plateau YouTube page. So already the one and, no, the, yeah, I think the first day, no, yeah, first two days, sorry, the one and two are already up on the YouTube channel. CMDA Plateau, just check for it. Uh, then uh, you'll be able to, to follow all that we have done, the introduction, what is lifestyle medicine and all that by Prof. Madaki, and then the exercise prescription. You know, those were the first two. Uh, then the happiness one, too, by Dr. Lamu is all up there on the YouTube channel. Uh, then uh, hopefully what we did yesterday and today, we will also upload on the channel. Uh, we will hope that uh, with the emails we have gotten, which you've sent, 
we can email you the CME form as well as uh, again the links to the video and also the slide if we have them. So uh, let me just uh, again say that all of this that we've done uh, is part of the CME activities of, of CMDA plateau. Uh, maybe in a few in a minute or two, let me just ask Dr. Akintayo, who is the state chairman, CMD Plateau, to just, just give a vote of thanks and maybe a little overview of what it is that we do uh, in CMDA. So Dr. Akintayo, over to you. Hello, Dr. Akintel. Hello. Hello, Dr. Lucius. Yeah, I don't know if he's, if he's not around. Okay, uh, let me, let me... okay, so Dr. Lucius can go ahead. Who is the secretary of okay. CMD Plateau? So you can, you can go ahead, sir. So let me thank you, sir, for um, being a wonderful host and thank all the participants and particularly our facilitators for the wonderful presentation this number of days. Um, I've been quite distracted, but today I had to listen and um, it's been quite an engaging uh, session that I attended today. And so like um, Dr. Gimba had earlier said, this is part of, or one of the activities that we, um, carry out in CMD, uh, the Christian Medical and Data Association. And we also have other programs. We meet from time to time um, as God gives us space uh, to fellowship together, to encourage one another um, in the Christian faith. And as doctors, as Christian doctors, we usually meet at Faith Alive, but we, because of this pandemic, we've been meeting online and um, God has been helping us. These meetings have also been quite impactful. Uh, besides meeting, we also organize outreaches where we reach out to people. So it's all about giving. It's all about showing the love of Christ. It's nothing about ourselves. It's just a place to um, discharge the love of God that God has given to us to you know, spread his love, share his good news, and win souls for Christ. So we want to appreciate us for coming. I want to encourage those of us who you know, have been members at some time or the other, and those who want to join to please come on board as the work is quite enormous. We still need a lot of hand and we need a lot of support, both financially, spiritually, and otherwise, so we need all hands on deck so that we can achieve this mandate that God has given us to care for the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. Once again, we want to thank everyone for participating and want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year ahead. God bless you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lucius. Uh, so again, we've come to the end. Uh, maybe just as way of closing, is it possible for us to all see our faces so that we can just wave our goodbyes? If you can put your videos on, I think it would be nice so that we all see our, our faces. Um, again, I, I, I know that uh, we have people outside Plateau State, they're a good number. Uh, in fact, at a point we had people outside Nigeria. So, it's, it's so nice that technology, you know, is allowing us to, you know, to do this in the comfort of our homes, you know, and, and all that. And of course, it has come with embarrassments for some people. I mean, you know, some have been caught, you know, in with very odd, a very odd position the, because again, they are too comfortable because of technology. <laughs> so, but so we, we, we thank God for, for that. So thank you so much for joining and again, uh, we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year. Um, I would just want to ask the, our MD Khan National Treasurer who is here with us, uh, Dr. Femi Taiwo, 
uh, to just say the closing prayer for us, and then we can say our final goodbye. Dr. Tao. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for all that you help us to achieve in this period. We thank you for unveiling to us how we've not, we thank you for unveiling to us how we should live our life. And we pray that all that we've learned will be able to put it to good use in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, as a family, we pray that you would help us, that we will grow in strength, we will grow in might, and we will move from one level of glory to another. We pray that by the time we are meeting to discuss another topic, we will have you know, the strength and even the mind to do much more. Thank you, Almighty Father, for in Jesus' most precious name we have prayed. Amen. 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 So thank you again, and um, we wish you well. Uh, yeah, so meeting is over. Thank you very much. Dr. Gimba, check your weight to check your weight today. When I come back, you tell me your weight. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll hold you to that. I'll check my weight, and I'll also I know say you too. You day is under them of obesity. I have been, I have been. It's, it's me that should check my weight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have, I have discovered a, a, um, a protocol that's working for me. I, I lost like um, three kg. Oh great! You know, in like how many weeks? You know, after and I gained it so fast, so I had to lose it back. Ah, it's so not back easy. Well done. It's not easy losing three kg. Honestly, no, well you saw done. you see me in the lounge now. You see how yes. I'm sick it, laughing. I told you <laughs> that I'm get, telling you my success <laughs> story. <laughs> so next, next, next time, courage, you will give us your success story. I've been yes. telling courage my success. I've been encouraging him to come on board. Okay. It's a mixture <laughs> of intermittent. Uh, if, if you must know, it's a mixture of intermittent fasting, you know, uh, and like uh, I think one Meshach said, just take tea like that in the morning and just eat sometime uh, around 12 from there about. Yeah, you know, fact, just reduce some, your portion. Some, some people have even advocated alternate days for the intermittent fasting. Uh -huh, something normal, like that. Normal days, then alternate days, you do the intermittent the, fasting. The key, the key, what I've discovered is the key. Look for something that you can do on a long stretch. Yes. This yes. emergency one will not work. Yes. Very true. Uh, but this Christmas, uh, <laughs> bye bye. Tell <laughs> <laughs> you are fasting. <laughs> Yeah. No, no. The bride, the, the, the bridegroom. The bridegroom is with us this Christmas. So, um, you know what the scripture says, um, You know, right. no fasting when the bridegroom is around. Uh, okay. So enjoy, enjoy yourselves, everyone, and thank you so much. Right. It's been a very no, good, no, good, no, Merry Christmas. You know, eventful. Uh, Merry program. Christmas. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Dr. Sophia, I can see you. Bye -bye. So, sorry, Bye -bye. Dr. Dr. Sophia, where, where are you from, ma? He's in Abuja. Abuja, okay. Yes. Okay, okay. All right, that's good. Yeah. She, she's a strong enemy person. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Oh, the, name, the name is kind of familiar. An, an, an M1, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. great to have Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. All right. Bye bye. So we will we will end the recording and end the meeting. <laughs>